Welcome to The Advisor with Stacey Chalemi, where we embark on a journey of personal growth, wellness, and empowerment. Join me, Stacey Chalemi, as we explore insightful conversations with experts and thought leaders to uncover valuable tips and actionable insights that will elevate your life. From discussions on leadership to emotional intelligence to navigating midlife challenges and embracing personal transformation, this podcast is your go-to resource for information, inspiration, and growth. So get ready to thrive, evolve, and unleash your true potential with me, your host, Stacey Chalemi. And today I am so excited because we have our famous coach and consultant, Raina, who's on the show. She's also part of our podcast community and she has her own podcast here on our show. So if you look her up and you'll see her name right on the left-hand side of your screen, you can look her up and she has her own podcast with lots of episodes for you to check out and learn from. Today, I'm very excited because Raina is going to talk about gender bias in the workplace. And this is something that really needs to be really uh, brought to people's attention and people need to really learn how to deal with this because this is a, a hot topic that you know occurs a lot and there's been some progress, but it's still going on. And Rain is here to give us all the information we need. So put your ears on and listen. How are you doing, Raina? I'm great. How are you? Good. So tell everybody that have it, that may, if they haven't seen you already speak a little about yourself and what you do. Sure. Thanks, first of all, Stacey, for having me on the show again. This is very exciting, and I'm really excited about this topic. So I appreciate you taking the time to talk to me. Oh, you're very welcome. So tell us a little about the gender bias in the workplace. You know, things have been changing over time, you know, um, you know, when you go back into the 60s and the 70s and the 80s and the 90s. Oh, my goodness. There was a lot of, you know, gender bias in the workplace, you know, even in the early 2000s. But, you know, as time goes on, things are changing a little, but there's still a lot going on that hasn't changed. So, you know, what's your intake when it comes to gender bias in the workplace? Yeah, sure. And I'll take a step back because I realized I did not answer your first question, which is to tell you a little bit about myself. So uh, for those who don't know, I am the founder and CEO of a women-centered leadership coaching and consulting company. It's called Rising Tide Consulting. And I've been leveraging my experiences in investment banking, in consulting, in nonprofit, in higher education, as well as my skills that I've gotten from relaunching my own career, I took about 11 years off to raise my daughters. And so I relaunched my career into higher education. And so I've taken sort of all of that experience now and using it to consult with different organizations and individuals as well. Uh, I think one of the main things that I focus on is understanding that even though there are different industries and functions that have different programs, DEI programs, there are two consistent observations that I continue to make. And the first is that women themselves are yearning for more in their jobs. So they want to feel fulfilled. They, they like being in positions where they feel like they're growing. They want to make a difference though. And then the second thing is that there are still, as you were just saying, there are many structural challenges, right? That women are still facing in the workplace. And so irrespective of whatever industry or whatever function they're in, whether they're early career, mid-career seasoned professionals in women dominated industries and male dominated industries, really there are things that are causing them to stagnate there are things that are causing them to feel unfulfilled and they're really unable to advocate for themselves. So I launched this company in support of women to help them overcome some of these limiting beliefs, but also to really help organizations who want to make sure that they retain their women, that they make sure that they are giving them the voice, not being talked over in meetings, not uh, and, and having equal opportunity to put themselves out for certain professional development opportunities or projects that they may be wanting to work on or raises that they may want or promotions that they've also earned. So really that's, that's, I do that in the form of individual or group coaching. I do that in the form of keynote speaking and serving on panels. And I do that in the form of retreats and workshops as well. So I have a lot of different, it really just depends on the organizations and, and the individuals that I'm working with. Um, so really my hope is just to create a world in where we thrive as women on our own terms um, and that we strive for everything that we are striving for 
by creating a growth container in which each of us can feel like we're coming forward with our own authenticity, with a sense of reflection and gratitude and accountability, not only for themselves, but that I'm also held accountable for them and, and they for me as well. So some, you know, like a combined, almost like a growth container. So that's a little bit about myself, but let me tell you um, your question to answer about gender bias. So mm -hmm. I think a good place to, to start would probably be what is gender bias, right? Um, mm -hmm. And I think it's this tendency that we have to give preferential treatment to one gender over the other, right? So another way to look at this would be it's a form of unconscious bias. So it occurs when someone unconsciously or sometimes consciously attributes certain attributes and stereotypes to a group of people. Mm -hmm. And the challenge and the concern is that it has very far reaching effects and it has a very profound impact on each of us as individuals. And then it impacts as a result, the organizations that we serve. So, and the result is often that it hurts women's confidence. It restricts our career advancement. It mm -hmm. perpetuates gender inequality. And these negative repercussions really, um, they, they, like I said, they, they go well beyond just our individual experiences. They influence our overall motivation. They influence our well-being. Um, we want to work in a place where we're not carrying all of these burdens that we can be authentic and come as ourselves and and be free in in the way that many other gender well the other gender is you know able to a lot more than we are for example and so there are a lot of examples of gender bias uh, and how it presents itself in the workplace but what we can do what I'll probably do is just focus on a few. So one might be in hiring practices where qualified females are, their candidates are really strong, but they're overlooked in, in favor of male candidates, right? Um, even if they have the same qualifications, the same background, the same experiences, uh, this also presents itself when we are seeking career advancement, we face barriers because we're evaluated on different standards than our male counterparts. And this parity results in fewer promotion opportunities. It hinders our professional growth. And of course, we all know the very common unequal pay, right? That's a national challenge as well. And despite comparable job responsibilities, comparable qualifications, we know that women make about 84 cents on the dollar that men make, right? So this right. bias is present and it, it's a form of exclusion. So when people talk about having DEI in the workplace, when they're not able to overcome and deal and face these challenges, it that you know this this is a big big reason why women leave the workforce. Um, they're not part of the decision making process. It limits our ability to contribute meaningfully. Um, so it just makes it a lot harder to retain women. And it makes it a lot harder for us to want to be part of that community. Yeah. Now, that, that being said, it's not all bad news, right? Um, we're moving in the right direction to some extent. Different organizations are facing different challenges, but many are using ERGs, those employee resource groups. Uh, yeah. They're providing safer spaces for women to learn and build their community. People are recognizing that this is something women need also a sense of community studies have shown more than than men, for example. Um, and then we all know that when women come together, we create amazing things. We we have yeah. positive energy, we're understanding, we're relatable, we're yeah. super intelligent and inclusive, we like to dialogue. So all of that um, is also why allyship is going to be really important in this conversation, because we want to listen and we want to provide the resources each other needs and show up for each other in that way. Right, exactly, exactly. Do you feel that women feel pressured that they have to, um, you know, show um, more, they have to do more in order to be recognized? Yeah, I do. I think that we feel often over overlooked. And so we have to take, a lot of times, you know, what we do is we take on that extra work thinking, oh, if I take on this extra work, it's unpaid, 
it's unrecognized labor, but I'll take on this extra work because I want them to see what a great employee I am. So right. we're not being, we're not even being evaluated on the same level, but then we're also putting so much more pressure on ourselves. And that right. doesn't really, that doesn't, that doesn't serve anyone. It doesn't serve the organization because we burn out. That certainly doesn't serve us because we're not making that progress. We're just doing more work. So it right. shows up in many different ways, yes. Now, what are some things women can do to overcome uh, bias in the workplace? Yeah, so I think there are a lot of things we can do. I'm, I'm trying to think of where to start, right? So <laughs> I think the first thing would be making sure that each of us is heard in, in meetings. Um, so one of the things that I always like to recommend is if you know that someone is being talked over or someone is running away with somebody with a, another woman's idea, then it's really important to speak up in that moment. Um, right. Because when you stay quiet and you don't say, hey, hey Stacy, I understand that you were just about to finish your thought. Can you, you, you started saying what you were saying, but I we didn't get to hear the rest of it. Could you please expand a little bit more? So me right. jumping in and saying, hey, Stacy, like you, your, your, your information, your opinion, your perspective is value. And so please finish your thought. Then that sort of sends a signal to other people at the table that yeah. they, they should not interrupt, right? Um, and the other piece of it is that if, if I don't do that, then and you stay quiet and you're not in a position, let's, sometimes people, women aren't in a position to advocate yeah. for se themselves. They're looking for other people to help them and move through that space. So they are considered, when they speak less, they're, con they're considered as people who have less influence, which may not be true, but they're just, they're, they, we, we all tend to make ourselves small. So in yeah. instead, sitting front and center in meetings and encouraging each other to speak and calling out, oh, right, Stacy had that idea. She was talking about that earlier to me. Um, Stacy, since you've given it a lot of thought, why don't you give us some feedback on on how you think we should address this specific challenge, right? Um, right. So you're looking in for ways to to shape the conversation so women aren't interrupted. You're interjecting in that moment because you want to hear her finish. Um, right. I think those are great ideas. Now, for women who lack confidence, what are some of the things that women can do? to feel more confident within themselves. Because a lot of times women have so much to give and they have, um, you know, is what's holding them back is, is the lack of confidence just underestimating their abilities when their abilities are well above the average. Yeah, so I think it depends on where that lack of confidence is coming from. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes, you know, as I was saying earlier, we tend to make ourselves feel small. So is it the inner critic? Is it imposter syndrome? Is it something like the likability penalty, right? So oh. as women, what ends up happening is we face this double standard. There's this double bind. And what we want to do is we want to challenge this likability penalty. Yeah. When a woman speaks in a direct way, uh, she pushes forth her ideas. She's referred to as aggressive and ambitious, right? Uh, that mm -hmm. happens a lot. When men do the same, He's confident, he's strong. Um, and so normalizing speaking in a specific way, in a direct style, being encouraged by other women again, and commenting and saying things like, I appreciate your directness. Um, mm -hmm. That's a great idea. Your ideas make sense to me because of X, Y, and Z. This is another actionable way that we can make that switch and if we're lacking confidence, but we're able to do this for another woman, right? We, we've talked about this before where we're so good at advocating for other women. So if you're lacking that confidence yourself to speak up for yourself, another way to do it is to start speaking up for others. Yeah. And then you'll also build that strength to then speak up for yourself as well. Um, another, I think, way to address the low confidence is to learn to take a compliment, for example, right? Yeah. Or to celebrate your accomplishments. It's mm -hmm. oftentimes structurally we are set up when someone says, oh, even if it's the simplest thing, like, oh, Stacey, I love your shoes. That has right. nothing to do with work. Automatically, <laughs> you're going to feel sometimes like saying, oh, I love yours too. You know, you know, yeah. you want the attention off of you. And that's, again, that's not really serving anyone 
thank you, Raina, for I, I bought these shoes at so-and-so or these were gifted to me and I really enjoy wearing them because they make me feel more confident, right? So I, so that's that's a compliment, but really it's the same idea with our accomplishments. So what happens is we're given less credit sometimes for our successful outcomes and we're yeah. often blamed more for the failure piece. So mm -hmm. let's start with recognizing when we are acknowledged for our accomplishments, because that's, that's where we need to demonstrate that we didn't just get lucky. Um, these are not external factors. We work for this. We've helped others and we've worked for this. So men will typically attribute their accomplishments to their innate qualities and their skills. So that's what shows their confidence, right? Mm -hmm. We credit our accomplishments to, we, we do say, we think we're getting lucky or that we, so many people have helped me get where I am. So yeah. we take the attention off of ourselves. Right. And so building that confidence again is owning our success. It's yeah. owning it instead of undermining ourselves. Um, so I think these dynamics will often contribute to, to accomplishments that we've made that will either they get unnoticed and when they do, we just play them down. Um, and so oh. normalizing, celebrating our and each other's accomplishments is what helps, right? Because we say, as I love to say, a rising tide lifts all boats. Yes. Mm-hmm. I feel like also a great way also sometimes is, is to find women groups you know, of other business owners and entrepreneurs and, and join those groups, you know, so you can get, not only will it help your confidence, but you might get some other ideas from other women. How do you feel about reaching out and, and trying to find like organizations or support groups, you know, that can be there as a kind of, you know, to help us to, you know, get through that bias and overcome that bias? I, I love that question because I've spent the last year of my life really surrounding myself with people who are just good human beings. And women are such a big part of that. They're not the only part of that. But yes. when you get together a group of women, whether it's happy hour um, or it's, like you said, it's some kind of a support group or women intentionally getting together because they are navigating being mothers and working, or they are relaunching their career or um, whatever situation that they're in, right? Um, right. Th when, when we normalize that, we normalize promoting ourselves and we, we promote each other automatically. Um, and yeah. so you walk away from these conversations feeling very lifted. You feel, and you do the same for others. And so yeah. I highly recommend surrounding yourself with women who are like-minded like that. Now there are all women like that? No, but it, it becomes pretty easy to, to weed them out very quickly because they don't last very long in these, uh, they're, they're not trusted enough in a sense, right? We've all yeah. worked with those women who, who can't be trusted. We've yeah. also worked with those women who are just always in our corner. They're talking about all the wonderful things we're doing when we're not in the room. Those are the women that you want to, the women that you want to surround yourself with. Oh, I agree. Totally. I think it's also good too, like, you know, and you can tell me what your thoughts are is to find women that are actually have accomplished more than you. So you could actually learn from them and grow from them, have them be your mentor. What do you think about that? Yeah, I think mentorship is really important. And I'm going to get to this in a second, because I think sponsorship is even more important. But what you said really resonates with me, because when I introduce, if I were to introduce you to someone, I would start with you, you know, saying this is Stacey Chalemi, and then I would explain what your accomplishments are, what you do, uh, and talk about something very specific that you've done that's been very impactful, right? It could be right. something small, but it still can be very impactful. Um, yes. And that's how I'm building you up. And then yeah. when you learn, when you see that somebody else is doing that for you, you're going to go turn around and do the exact same thing, right? So yeah. um, AI is a big thing. So I'm going to try and use an example from AI. But let's say um, I'm working with someone called Layla and um, 
she's led all the research and the policy around AI for our company. And she's broken down the confidentiality piece, the copyright piece, the research piece, the, whatever the different pieces are. Um, and yeah. uh, she's she's worked on this project and here are her accomplishments. Yeah. And here's what she's done. Like, that's really exciting. That's a talking point for you to have this conversation with someone. And it's really interesting. It's something interesting, right? About this person. Right. So you want to hear more. Um, so picking in, in exciting topics and um, just sharing that with people. Yeah. Because that's how people relate. Oh, that's really interesting. And then AI impacts everybody. So they'll automatically right. jump into the conversation. So they'll engage automatically. I love that. I love that idea. I think, you know, it's it's so important for, for women to center themselves around the right people and also to consider maybe, you know, excluding the negativity around themselves because sometimes there are people that you like, but they have a very negative aura or energy about them. And, you know, sometimes you have to, especially if you want to grow and you want to, you know, you want to get away from the gender bias in your workplace and you want to be strong and you want to be noticed you have to really look at, you know, who you're surrounding yourself with, because those people can actually pull you down and keep you stagnant. And, you know, so when you do present yourself in the workplace, you know, you're not as you're not reaching that high potential that you could, because you're not surrounding yourself with the right people. You know, how do you feel about that? Yeah, I mean, I think a big part of this is we're also very quick to blame ourselves if something goes wrong. You know, we all know as leaders, if something goes wrong with the team, if the team does something that's not ideal, then the leader steps up and says, this is, you know, this is on me and these are all the reasons why. But yeah. oftentimes the default ends up being, irrespective of whether it's a male leader, female leader, the default often goes to blaming the woman. Um, mm -hmm. And so doing things like sharing each other's accomplishments and staying clear of people who are willing to throw other women under the bus or women under the bus and sharing our accomplishments and not being shy about um, taking the blame when it's legit and then not taking the blame when it's, it's it, there's no need to take that blame. And, and I'm right. not saying that this is logical because it's not logical, but this is what happens. And so what we want to do is we want to spend our energy looking at it as this is the problem that we're trying to solve, not you're to yeah. blame or he's to blame or I'm to blame or she's to blame, right? Um, so all that that blame comes from that place of negativity that you were just talking about. And so you right. want to step away from some of that. It's just like that negativity that you're saying, oftentimes people ask me, how do you deal with the toxic environment? Well, yeah. the first thing you do is disengage. Mm -hmm. It is so common and so easy for people to go into each other's offices or walk over to each other's cubes or get on a quick Zoom call and say, you are not going to believe what just happened. And then it perpetuates and it creates the sense of negativity and this this feeling that they can come to you all the time to just complain where yeah. nobody's being productive. They're not being productive. You're not being productive, right? So right. really disengaging in that. And there are many ways to do that, but making sure that you're disengaging so that you're not participating in that negativity. Right, exactly, 100%. I know I, I think you know these are such important factors and you know when you when you look at the work bias in the in the in you do, um in in the workplace is there common things that you see that hold women back maybe common mistakes that they make yeah let's see common mistakes that women make that hold them back i think not standing up for themselves when they're being talked over Mm -hmm. um, I think not putting their name in the hat when there is an opportunity for a promotion or being working on a project that's going to be high profile because in their head, they just don't think that they're good enough or that they don't think right. that they have the skills or the capabilities or, or the background. Um, right. The reality is that women are just prone to this intense level of self-doubt. Yeah. more than men are. I'm not saying that all women are like this and I'm not saying that men don't have it at all. It's just yeah. uh, in general, we're prone to more intense self-doubt. And that is a very structural thing. Um, and it's not because we're missing that confidence gene. It, it's it's yeah. because, because 
female performance is often underestimated. And as I was saying earlier, we're blamed for more, right? Um, we face an uneven playing field at work. Um, sometimes the bias is just so pronounced that it's, I've seen this happen too, where a woman will change her name to a man's name on a resume and the reaction and the response is completely different. So what ends up happening is we end up having to work a lot harder for a lot of things. Yeah. So, so the key is setting yourself up and getting the support that you need, whether it's, it, it really, it comes from an unbiased source, right? So we were talking yeah. a little bit about mentoring um, and, and I was men I mentioned the word sponsoring. It's really important to find mentors, yes. It's very difficult, especially the higher up you move to find mentors who you can trust. So right. it is in everyone's favor if you you work with people on some of these challenges that you're facing with someone from the outside, someone yeah. who is hired either by you or by your organization, because they are coming in with the intent to help you grow as a leader, but, but right. also to help the organization move forward in the way that they need to, to move forward. So everybody wins, right? So there's that mentorship piece. As you get more senior, it becomes harder having somebody who's an external coach, external consultant come in truly helps there. The yeah. other piece is sponsoring women, right? We, I talked about how people talk about you when you're not in the room. Right. And what sponsoring is, the difference between mentoring and sponsoring is, is going into rooms and saying, you need to take a chance on this woman. She is amazing. I have worked with her. She is, and then being able to say that these are all the amazing things and how the company or the individual or the team is going to benefit from working with her. So it's right. not just rah, rah, I'm in your corner. I'm going to yeah. mentor you. It's I'm going to put your name out there. I'm going to be that person who is going to advocate for you and speak about how great you are based on my own experience. And I think mm -hmm. that finding those people is in some ways a lot more important than finding, uh, than finding mentors. Right. I think it is. It's very hard sometimes to find people to trust. And I think that that's a great point is to find outside people and, and people, you know, sometimes it's, it's nice to find person who can give you an unbiased opinion too. you know, someone who doesn't have an emotional attachment to you, but is willing to want to help you. So they kind of, you know, they, they look at your situation, they look at what you're trying to get across the message and they give you an unbiased opinion. Cause sometimes if we go outside the, 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 um, the workplace too, if we go to our friends and family, you know, sometimes it's not always the greatest, you know, idea because, you know, they, they're not familiar with what we do and they, you know, they're a little bit on the bias side where if you go to somebody who doesn't, knows what you do, knows, you know, who you are, but doesn't know everything about you, but you, you tell them the situation, they can give you like an unbiased opinion, which could probably be beneficial. What are your, what's your intake on that? Yeah, I think that has a lot also to to do with receiving and giving feedback, right? Yeah. So mm -hmm. you're right, your friends and family, most of the time they're going to see the good, hopefully <laughs> your friends and family are going to see the good in you. They may not necessarily be able to point out or you may not take it as seriously because they don't work with you when they yeah. give you feedback. Like, okay, I'm a different person at home, for example, than I am in my work. So yes. you may not take it as seriously, right? So. Right. I think, and, and especially for women, because we we don't receive as much feedback and the yeah. feedback that we actually do end up receiving can be less helpful at times. So I right. can give you some examples. Um, so oftentimes women are, the feedback that we get is good job or well done. Um, so I think HBR did this study where uh, they, they, Let's see, what did they do? They, HBR did a study uh, and found that there's about, there's this fear that men have actually, that if you give a woman honest feedback, that she's going to start to break it down into tears or she's gonna get very visibly upset. Okay, I know, and you're rolling your eyes for a very, very good reason. That does not 
happen. Like I have, I have led a lot of teams and that has, that doesn't, that's not the norm. Um, yeah. Right. And so what happens is women are 15% more likely than men to receive that vague feedback. Yeah. And then when they do get that feedback, men receive that feedback on that, the business outcomes, the actual right. outcomes themselves. Whereas we receive feedback on how we communicated. So how we communicated in a meeting as opposed to what the outcome of that meeting is, right? Right. Um, so one of the things that I have found to be very helpful in the teams that I've led is we discuss giving and receiving feedback and the best way each of us as individuals receive and give feedback, what the manager's expectations are. And what I like to do is I like to take gender completely out of the equation. We yeah. talk about individually what's the right way because people do receive and give feedback in different ways. And it's important to learn that as a skill, right? Yeah. We always say know your audience. Um, also know what, when you're getting feedback from somebody, know their perspective as well, whether yes. you're the audience or you're speaking to the audience right um yeah, so what you don't want to do is you don't want to shy away from providing that constructive feedback because then she's not going to grow nobody grows in that case mm -hmm. um and and notice you know i'm not using the word criticism because it's not criticism right uh, it's not the same we want to provide and we want to receive feedback so that mm -hmm. we can be better at our jobs and we want more than good job well done we want yeah. to know what the impact was, right? As I was saying earlier, we yearn for more. We, as women, want to make a difference. And we can't make that difference if we're not getting the feedback that's going to help us beyond, hey, you've got something stuck in your teeth, which we also very much <laughs> want to tell each other, right? <laughs> but it's, it goes well beyond that. Yes. Oh, 100%. 100%. And I think, you know, women sometimes take criticism much better than men, to be honest with you. I think sometimes men can be more sensitive. You know, I've come across that, you know, so it's uh, it's really a stereotype, if you ask me. You know, I think women, you know, they exemplify a lot of resilience. You know, we wear so many different hats, you know, not only, you know, are we working women in, in the in the in the workforce, but we're also, you know, many people are, you know, mothers and many people are caretakers and many people are, you know, they're 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 running back and forth with various you know, numerous responsibilities, you know. Know, their husband we had a husband or a wife or whatever the case may be and and you know they're they're juggling like seven different hats you know at the same time so that that to me shows strength that shows intelligence that shows multitasking you know and um i think we need to be recognized for that 100 percent. i mean think about all the things that you just listed that's most of the women i know that's their norm right yeah. um and so from that perspective, making it all the more reason to know that we are so capable and we are so understanding and we are so collaborative because yeah. we know that it takes a village and we know that it takes a team. And so we go in with that mindset. It's, it's all the structural things that happen that sometimes can hold us back. But the more women we have in leadership positions who understand this, the yes. better, because then they're going to bring all the other women along with them. Right now, what we're struggling for is to make sure that we get those women in those in those seats, right? Yes. Um, so absolutely. Yeah, I, I think it's so important because I think people, you know, like I said earlier on in the conversation, I think women have to realize how much value they bring to the table and believe in themselves. I think, you know, once, you know, it, once they show belief in themselves, it will shine through, you know, and the the more confidence they have, you know, the, the more they'll, they'll speak up for themselves and, you know, let their voice be known. Yeah, I always say lead by example, how how and advocate for yourself the way you would advocate for someone else because we do that really well yeah. and if you so if you feel like you can't advocate for yourself try and put yourself in a position where you are advocating for someone else and advocate that way and until you're able to do that continue to advocate for others because you will gain that skill and then you'll realize oh wait i can do that too i am capable like that too I have those accomplishments too, just like she does. And that will help also build confidence. 
Oh, I definitely agree with you. Now, when you look at our conversation today, like what are some of the of the the things that you would like to really emphasize, you know, some of the core values that we've talked about today that you feel are really important, you know, what are some of the things that you want to um, really factor out? Yeah. So uh, we talked about uh, supporting each other, supporting ourselves, supporting each other until we can also learn to support ourselves, but then continuing again, of course, to support each other, uh, that we can create the sense of solidarity, the sense of empowerment, um, we're often facing common challenges, right? Common biases in various aspects of our life. But one underlying factor is that while my situation may be different, a lot of the underlying biases, a lot of the politics, a lot of the societal norms we're facing as a gender. So yeah. supporting each other really creates this collective strength um, that helps us overcome these barriers. Who knows better than we do? So right. let's lift each other up, right? So surround yourself with women who are dedicated to promoting each other, um, yes. promoting each other's strengths and speaking very highly of you when you're not in the room. And the best way to do that is to show up um, as the woman who who promotes other women. Lead by example in that sense, right? And then oh, yeah. remember that women supporting other women can also challenge and break down these stereotypes and biases that we talked about earlier. Yes. So there's so much of this, in, there's so much of allyship in this. Um, yeah. As we support each other's achievements, um, it challenges this notion that women are in competition with each other and that their yeah. success is limited. And if we can challenge that, then I feel like societal attitudes will change and will promote a lot more inclusivity. Um, right. We also just talked generally about uh, serving as allies for other women, um, providing mentorship and sponsorship, mm -hmm. creating positive role models, um, sharing our own experiences, validating each other's experiences, knowing that um, supporting and guiding each other that we yeah. can lift everybody up right and so right. many of us are in uncharted territories every day um and as we figure things out let's share that knowledge yeah. let's let's do this together um right. it's a lot more fun to do things together and we're collaborative so why not bring yeah. each other in the process right um and there's so many groups now like you said that are out there that are willing and wanting to do this whether it's making helping some are i i talked to a group the other day that's holding each other accountable for making specific connections. So you gain points if you help each other make connections to help improve their small businesses, right? So there right. are different ways that we can do this and that we can show up for each other. And ultimately that will help us show up for ourselves and then market ourselves and advocate for ourselves in a different way. So as we champion each other's achievements and advocate for equal opportunities, um, that's how we're going to create this positive shift, this positive change. And then right. this collective advancement, it's not just going to impact you or me or one other person. It's, go it's going to impact all the future generations that come behind. Oh, very well said. Very well said. Now, what are some of the services that you could provide? Can you tell us about the services? Yeah, sure. So uh, from an individual perspective, from I do a lot of individual executive or leadership coaching. Um, and so that's something that I do over three months, six months, 12 months. I also work with a lot of organizations who, as I mentioned earlier, really want to make sure that their women feel supported, that they feel like they're progressing in their careers. They're provided with professional development, especially now with the market's a bit wonky, I like to say. And, and mm -hmm. as a result, a lot of companies don't have the the funds to give significantly high merit increases in, in everyone's salaries. So yeah. another way to support your people is to really help them with the professional development piece. And yeah. women who feel supported are going to be more productive. They're going yeah. to they're going to focus their energy, anyone, it's not just women. If you're if you have someone who on the outside is helping you navigate some of the challenges that you're facing, you're not yeah. expending your energy 
on something that you're not the expert in. You're expending your energy on the tasks that have been assigned to you by the organization that you, the goals, the annual goals, or whatever it is that you need to achieve. So right. that outside support, it, it, the ROI is, is tenfold, right? Yeah. And so really helping organizations who want to promote their women and support them by doing group coaching, keynote speaking, I'm on panels at conferences, uh, I'm participating in some retreats in the new year to help uh, women's retreats through organizations uh, who are doing, you know, one or two day offsites. So there are so many different ways. So whether it's from the individual perspective or from the organization perspective, but the best way is to really just reach out to me on LinkedIn or send me an email. Oh, that sounds great. Now, where can people find you? What's your website address? Yes. So my website is www.risingtideconsultingllc.com. I'm rebranding the whole thing at the moment, but uh, so that'll take a couple of weeks. So you can definitely find me on that, but I highly recommend um, really following me on LinkedIn and reaching out that way or sending me an email at Raina, it's R-A-I-N-A at risingtideconsultingllc.com. Uh, and I will get back to you very quickly. I love it. I love it. Now, before we go, is there anything else that you want to uh, maybe add to the conversation or anything that we may not have talked about that you want to uh, let the listeners know about? Yeah, I think, you know, I think we're, we're in a space now where there are going to continue to be a lot of changes, especially given that the election is next month. It's less than a month <laughs> away, right? And so a lot of organizations are going to want to get ahead of this a little bit. And mm -hmm. for those organizations who are, whose fiscal year ends in December and they need to use some of their funds, I think this is the right time to start investing and showing your support of, of the women in, in your organization and your desire to help lift them and promote them and progress them. So this is also a good time to set things up so that in the new year, you're setting them up for success. Oh, I love that. That is such a great idea. I think that's so important because it is, it's, we're coming to the end of the year now we're coming to, you know, elections are coming up and, you know, people, especially organizations, uh, you know, they have to, you know, any money they didn't spend yet, they need to, you know, focus on donating or, or giving to certain, you know, charities or, you know, different services they could provide for others. And this would be a great way to support other women is by helping other women and helping other women organizations so they can build and they can actually reach out and, and do more for, you know, the, the women in the workforce, because there's so much that, you know, needs to be accomplished. You know, we, there are so many entrepreneurs that are women out there. There are so many women that are making, you know, six figures and are, they are even more so in the seven figures, but there is still a lot of women out there that don't have the power. That's just a small percentage. You know, they need to feel the power within and, you know, that, you know, and by doing everything that you mentioned today, I think women can really connect with themselves and connect with other, other women. They can really, you know, really shine and, and be the person that they really dreamt of becoming because they have it in them. It's, it's just utilizing it and making their voice be known. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And everybody wins. Everybody I mean, wins. Women feel heard and seen which is very important to us. We feel like we're making a difference and organizations yes. win because they're supporting their women. And so yes. they're getting their perspective. They're, they're making room for them at the table. They're learning from them who people who are more inclusive, more collaborative. Their women are amazing to work with. We know, right? So yeah. it's, it's a win-win for everybody. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. Well, Raina, this has been amazing. Thank you again for coming on the show. And I look forward to our next conversation soon. You are just amazing. And thank you so much for everything you do and for everything that you bring on the table, because these are important topics that I think, you know, really need to be really uh, heard because it's not talked about as much, you know, it's there, but it's not talked about as much. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you for having me and giving me an opportunity to talk about this. I could talk about it all day. So I really appreciate your time. <laughs> oh, you're very welcome. And you have a great day. You too.